Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. Today the topic of my presentation is Advanced Pass Detection Strategy Using Peer-to-Peer -peer Signal Communication, a pilot study that was done recently to improve pass travel time. So let's get started. I hope everyone is nice and warm because here in Calgary we are sitting at minus 36 degree right now. So bear with me. So a little bit of introduction on advanced bus detection. Um, so nowadays, various technologies are available for bus early detection, but each comes with their own limitations. For example, loops and cameras are conventional but expensive solutions, specifically if detection needs to be provided further away from an intersection. Centralized transit signal priority, or TSP, is an accurate and feasible solution that can actually detect a bus far away from an intersection. And this system is able to communicate the bus arrival to the downstream signal controller. Uh, currently, the city of Calgary is in the process of deploying the centralized TSP system, but the timeline of the implementation is unknown as, at this time. So in this regard, a temporary solution is to provide advanced bus detection based on bus travel time and peer-to-peer -peer signal communication. By peer-to-peer -peer signal communication, uh, what we mean is uh, that two signal controller uh, can actually communicate or talk to each other. So basically this whole study or this whole webinar is focused on how this advanced bus detection strategy was developed and how the peer-to-peer -peer signal communication logic was published. So the objective of this presentation is to test the advanced bus detection strategy in a section of the BRT transit way in Calgary, also known as Max Purple, uh, as a pilot project. This study will provide us some ideas on how bus signal delay and travel time can be improved without any additional infrastructure costs. So uh, basically, in order to uh, describe this study, how the peer-to-peer -peer communication was done and how this advanced bus detection strategy was developed, I will provide a little bit on the background of the study area and the problem description. So let's get started. So this is the 17th Avenue or Max Purple aerial view. Uh, so 17th Avenue or Max Purple BRT line is one of the newly built BRT lines. Uh, which was constructed at the end of 2018 in Calgary. This max purple BRT line, it connects the city center towards the east end of the city along the 17th Avenue. So this is the 17th Avenue, also known as International Avenue. So this BRT line connects the city center towards the east end of the city. So uh, as we can see in this picture, in a portion of the BRT line, there is a dedicated transit way. It has a separate right of way and it runs parallelly to the 17th Avenue vehicle traffic. So this portion has a separate transit way starting from here up to there. And from this portion, it runs as a median running transit way. And uh, also the 17th Avenue transit way provides a dedicated right of way for casual transit vehicles. The purpose for is to improve service reliability and to reduce congestion on the roadway. So this picture here, it shows the median running section. So at this section, as we can see, um, the BRT line runs uh, through the median uh, up to the uh, end of the east end of the city. So at this uh, signalized intersection along the transit way where it's median running, the transit signal phase is concurrent with the signal phase for eastbound and westbound general traffic. So the transit uh, buses go eastbound and westbound, and majority of the volume of traffic is in the eastbound and westbound direction. And uh, since this movement have the highest volume of um, traffic, the transit way also receives a considerable amount of green time in the signal cycle at this intersection. So because of the concurrent movement in the eastbound westbound direction, the buses get, gets considerable amount of green time. So along this corridor where it's median running, buses usually have a uh, smoother flow from intersection to intersection and along this corridor. Also, just to mention here that uh, along this BRT line, there is no transit uh, um, there is no actually uh, traffic signal preemption, and this is due to the negative impact on the overall signal operation. So no preemption uh, exists in this entire corridor. 
So uh, in the mostly in the dedicated transit way section, there are three signalized intersections which can be denoted by these red circles. At these three signalized intersection of the transit way, uh, because of the construction of this dedicated transit way, um, it has reduced the queue related delays. However, where it crosses uh, the ad grade intersection. So these three ad grade intersections, the transit way movement with vehicular and pedestrian movement. So for example, here, the transit way runs east west and there is considerable amount of traffic in the north south direction. So the movement of truck uh, buses actually conflict with vehicular and some of the pedestrian movement. And because of these, the transit way signal phase operates concurrently with a limited number of non-conflicting phases. So therefore the signal phase is only allotted a specific amount of time in the overall signal cycle. So if you look at this, if you focus at this particular intersection, so this is uh, basically 17th Avenue and 19th Street intersection. And if you look at this intersection, it's not a conventional type of intersection. We can see there are, there are lots of, so this red line is the transit way where it runs is bound and westbound and it has conflicting movement with lots of other movement. For example, it conflicts the northbound and southbound traffic. And there is also a northbound right turn here, as we can see. So it also, uh, there is a separate phase for this northbound right turn movement and the transit is also conflicting with this northbound right turn movement. So, and also there are pedestrian crossing here and here at these two locations. So we can see this is kind of a challenging intersection. And there are lots of other movements and uh, conflicting movements with the transit way. And because of this, this intersection has a huge cycle length, which is more than three minutes. And the transit phase, uh, eastbound and westbound is transit phase, as we can see, it's only concurrent with this eastbound and westbound movement here with vehicular traffic. And also the you know, southbound left turn movement is concurrent. So transit way is only concurred with a limited number of uh, movement because of this challenging intersection. That's why the transit way only uh, receives a small amount of time in the overall cycle length. So this is a problem specifically in this dedicated transit way sections where it crosses at grade because buses uh, usually stop at this intersection. They wait for their turn in the signal timing phase. So there is considerable amount of signal delay which also impact the travel time of the buses. So buses, the buses, they uh, get behind their schedule. There is problem with schedule adherence. So it was needed that some sort of measures should, should be uh, adopted here. So the bus signal delay can be reduced and travel time can be improved. Uh, the other factor is, uh, if you look at here, this north-south corridor, uh, it's one of the most important trade corridor in Calgary, also known as uh, Deerfoot Trail or Highway 2, which is the provincial highway here. So because of this proximity of this provincial highway, there is also some challenges because sometimes in the PM peak, the westbound traffic, it overflows the off ramp. So that's why it's sometimes challenging to allocate um, a sufficient amount of time for the transit bus phases in this uh, three specific intersection. So in the median running intersection, as I mentioned before, uh, the bus movement is comparatively smoother. However, only in this intersection, because of this conflicting movement, buses get a significant amount of delays in this intersection. So, uh, okay. Uh, so based on this problem uh, and what can be done to address this problem, this is how the study was designed. So basically the study was designed um, by a peer-to-peer -peer signal controller communication, as I mentioned before. So peer-to-peer -peer signal control communication is actually a signal controller can talk to the other signal controllers. So if you look at this picture, what happens? The upstream intersection plays a call to this downstream intersection. Uh, once a bus is detected at the upstream intersection and it leaves, the call uh, is essentially based on bus uh, detection at the upstream intersection and the estimated travel time. So as soon as bus is detected at this upstream intersection, based on the estimated travel time, a call is placed to the downstream intersection so that, so that the bus don't have to wait, it gets their turn or it gets their bus phase. And for estimating the bus travel time, uh, which is one of the most important component of this advanced detection, 
the loop detector data was used from the signal controller. So the loop detector data was actually based on bus arrival or checking time in the downstream intersection and also bus departure and checking time in the upstream intersection. So based on this bus departure checking time and then bus uh, arrival and checkout time, uh, travel time was estimated, which is again one of the important components of uh, designing this logic. I will go to the next slide. Uh, so it's kind of for a better understanding of uh, what is happening. So it's um, showing a transit way section schematic. It's kind of a hypothetical transit way section. So for example, we have intersection A and intersection B, and these red boxes are detectors. So every time uh, this detector is occupied by a bus, uh, usually a timestamp is written in the controller. And every time the bus leaves from the detector, a timestamp is also written. And same goes for the downstream intersection here. Bus comes, the timestamp is written, and the detector gets actuated. As soon as it gets deactuated, a timestamp is also written. So basically, based on the detector actuation and the timestamp, it is possible to know the travel time from intersection A to intersection B. So this is the overall concept of how the travel time was calculated. And also just want to mention that um, this is a transit way, meaning that only buses travel through this uh, transit way section, no other vehicles. So this is also based on the C4 principle, which is first in, first out. So that means the bus which will come here, definitely it comes here first and it will go there as first. So it's first in and first out. So the travel time is based on this C4 principle because there is no other vehicles on the transit way and there is no chance that buses will cross each other. So again, this is a conceptual overview of using loop detector and signal phase. Uh, so what this graph or picture shows us is how the detector data and the signal phase are tied to each other. On the top of the picture, we can see the phases of uh, traffic lights, so green, yellow, and red. And the bottom, it shows the detector actuation or activation. So for example, every time uh, uh, a bus arrives on a detector, the detector gets actuated. So a time step is given, and the detector event is logged in. And it gets logged in as long as it's occupied by the bus, as soon as bus depart from the detector, again, a timestamp is written. So this is how the signal delay uh, was calculated. So basically, the signal delay is the difference of departure time and arrival time of a particular intersection. So this is the departure time minus arrival time. And the travel time is the departure time minus arrival time. But it's for two consecutive intersections between upstream and downstream one. So it's also quite uh, clear from this picture that since, uh, like if you look at this picture, we can see since the buses arrive uh, at the red interval, so they were waiting on the detector for quite a bit of long time, so because the signal was red for them. But however, on the contrary, in the green and yellow interval, they just touched the detector, so it was not occupied for that long time. So this sort of information gives us a lot of insight on what is actually happening. Okay, so uh, based upon this entire principle and logic, uh, now I will show how the data was collected, analyzed, and at the end, I will show some of the results. So this is the example uh, of the raw data from the signal controller. So this is high resolution data, meaning that uh, data is coming from the signal controller 24-7 throughout the day. So it's very raw and it's high resolution, meaning that it comes uh, in every second and whenever there is an activity in any of the signal or detector phase. So the first column shows the intersection number. Uh, each intersection has a unique ID number uh, throughout Calgary. So this uh, unique ID number uh, identifies which intersection we are working on. It has a date and time stamp, the second column, and the third and fourth column is the phase status and the phase number. So phase status is basically uh, lots of code number. Uh, code number um, uh, it's unique to the controller, and each code number specifies uh, a specific event. And finally, the phase number is the number of the phases. And for phase number, we usually use here a standard uh, ring barrier controller or 
eight phase uh, RBC controller. So for example, if you look at here, so of our particular interest for the phase data, if we can see this small box, uh, is code 82 and code 81, because code 82 denotes the detector on event and code 81 de denotes the detector off event. So this is of our particular interest. We want to know when the detector was on and when the detector was off so that we can calculate the signal delay and travel time and phase number denotes, for example, is bound is phase four, is bound is phase eight and so on and so forth. So for example, if you look at this third and fourth row, so what we can say is say from this table is that at midnight at 10 seconds, uh, the wave sound detector was on and it was on for two seconds because we can see at 12 seconds the detector was off. So that's how like uh, the on and off event we can know actually and it's easy to say that there wasn't any signal delay because the detector was occupied only from two seconds. So meaning that maybe whatever vehicle was arriving, they caught their face and they just uh, went through. So this type of raw data from the signal controller, they tell us a lot of story, a lot of information, what is happening. Uh, and uh, all we can do, all we want to do is to extract those information to the user defined format. So uh, we want the signal delay and the travel time using this whole budget of information. So what we have done in this regard, we have developed um, a program or script. So every time the script is run, it captures all of those raw data and it present in a user-defined format, which I'm showing in the next slide. So this is how uh, the data is summarized uh, in a user-defined format. Um, after the script or program has run, it extracts the information from the raw data and presented it in this format. So what it shows us, the index number, which is a serial number, and the second column is the direction. So when we are only interested, bus movement is eastbound and westbound direction. So when we say eastbound, we can see that it goes from station 26 uh, street station to 28 uh, street intersection. So when we will select westbound, it will be the other way. So it will be going from 28th street to 26th street. And uh, this signal on zero and signal off zero is again the detector actuation and the event. So this is basically the departure signal on time at station zero. And then this is the signal off time at station zero. So signal delay is nothing but the difference of these two times. And same is true for this uh, intersection or station one, we can say. So the signal delay at this intersection is the difference between these two times. So this is how it's calculated. So program and the script, we uh, have written all the logic and everything. So the script was run, it took all the information, it's presented in this tabular format. And, uh, and how we calculated this travel time. So the travel time is nothing but the difference of this uh, column, as you can see, and this column. So essentially, um, Basically, this travel time is the difference of the departure time at the upstream intersection and the arrival time at the downstream intersection. By knowing this difference of the time in between the upstream and downstream intersection, the travel time was cal calculated, which is this orange cell. So this is how the entire um, uh, a data, raw data was organized and summarized in a tubular format. And as you can see, each row represents each trip of the buses. Again, this is a lot of data and uh, we need to kind of come up with some sort of like uh, pictorial representation so that have, we have a better visual understanding. So at the end of the day, we came up with this graph, which is the travel time summary. So for example, if we look at this histogram or bar diagram, we can see that uh, the travel time in a eastbound direction in a typical weekday at the PM period was 100 second or one minute 40 second. So that's how the travel time was calculated. And as I mentioned earlier, this travel time is one of the important components of calculating our signal logic because based on this travel time, the controller in the downstream intersection will determine one, when the bus phase has to on for the upcoming buses from the upstream intersection. So basically this estimated travel time is used to design the signal time logic. So based upon this data, the travel time data, and all of 
the other data. This is how the peer-to-peer -peer signal logic and communication was established. Uh, so again, if you look at this picture, this is upstream intersection, this is the downstream intersection. So in the step one, the upstream intersection plays a call to the downstream intersection once a bus presence is detected here in the upstream intersection. As soon as a call is registered to the downstream intersection, the conflicting fields are omitted and a call is placed for the bus phase in the downstream intersection. So as soon as a call is placed, this downstream intersection will omit all the conflicting phases, which are the north south movement or any fence movement if there is pedestrian movement, uh, if there is any sort of pedestrian movement or conflicting movement, or if there is a new call for the north or south or the conflicting movement, the downstream intersection will not accept any new call because there is a call from the downstream intersection. But this call is placed with a delay time, which is equal to the bus travel time that we have just showed. So a call is registered from the upstream intersection at the downstream intersection. So what it means that the downstream intersection, it will, the controller will make itself ready so that after approximately the estimated travel time, which is like one minute 40 seconds, when buses arrive here, they will get their face and they will move uh, smoothly through the intersection. And at step four, the logic is cleared as soon as the bus face turns green. So as soon as this bus face is green, all the call and all the logic will be cleared. So no uh, advanced call from the upstream intersection, but if there is an next bus which is placing the call, then a new call will be registered and these steps will start all over again. So this is basically the overall concept, how the peer-to-peer -peer signal logic was uh, designed. Um, so uh, every time there is a call from the upstream intersection, uh, the conflicting phases will be either omitted or there will not be any new um, call for the conflicting phases in the next intersection so that buses can have a smooth flow and then don't have to stop in the intersection. So based upon this uh, logic principle and the data, um, we have done some before after analysis in some of the intersections to see how uh, or to evaluate what is the estimated benefit that we have achieved from this logic. So this is a result of the before and after scenario and uh, this is actually an example which was taken uh, from only one of the intersections uh, which is uh, uh, 19th street, uh, the intersection, the complicated one that I just uh, uh, showed before and it's only one intersection in one direction the before after signal delay comparison for an aim peak so uh, what this uh, graph shows us is uh, there is a before scenario so the before scenario the blue bar it indicates when uh, nothing was done so the buses were coming they were waiting for their turn so we had some sort of like um, you know, we needed to develop some sort of measure to take care of uh, that and the interim the gray bar is actually when uh, we gathered some of the bus travel time, we made some adjustment in the signal timing, and then we implemented the signal timing in the field, we captured the data, and we didn't see much improvement. So we went on with further observation, further tweaking the signal timings and everything until we uh, achieved some sort of level of expectation. So the after data was, after lots of adjustment was made in the uh, signal timings and we were fortunate because in these locations we have some traffic cameras installed so it's a good visual observation on how the buses are behaving at the stopping so based upon this visual observation the data and also the logic lots of adjustments were done so after is actually whenever the adjustment uh, were implemented in the field so what this graph shows us the x-axis is the signal delays in second, and the y-axis uh, shows the number of trips. So uh, from uh, the graph, we can say that actually it was possible to have 71% of the trips to have a signal delay, which is less than 10 seconds. So, uh, and any signal delay, which is less than 10 seconds, we can say that there is no signal delay, and it's also in our studies considered no signal delay, which is less than 10 seconds. So that's how, uh, how we evaluated our data and then uh, we, were at, uh, we, were achieved, uh, we were able to achieve some sort of uh, outcome um, uh, or improvement uh, in the after scenario. Again, this is only 
for this example is only for uh, one particular intersection in one direction only. However, I want to mention that there are a couple of challenges uh, while implementing this signal logic. For example, uh, for this particular uh, uh, graph that I showed, the results are based on the intersection when there is no station between, in between to the intersection. But if there is a station that exists in between two intersections, uh, there are some challenges because uh, if there is a station, that means uh, some dual time uh, is involved in the station, which is one of the most unpredictable or variable component in the travel time. So if there is a station in between two intersections, it gives us uh, some challenges uh, in developing this logic because the dual time is kind of unpredictable. So when we add up the dual time in the travel time component, um, it, it has some sort of variability. So this is one of the challenges. The other challenges, um, one of the other challenges I can mention is since this is a transit way, only buses using the transit way eastbound and westbound direction. So sometimes what happens, the eastbound buses, they use the opposing lane. So that means the eastbound buses, they sometimes veered off to the westbound buses, which means the westbound, uh, there is the activation in the westbound detector, which place a false call in the downstream intersection, even though there is no physical buses coming from the westbound direction. So uh, this is also lesson learned through this uh, entire study. And, um, um, and this component involves driver's uh, education sort of training. So uh, uh, some training components were incorporated so that the drivers follow the rule that they have to stay in their own lane. So those are some of the challenges, and also this is a study that's in progress. So we are still um, trying to improve uh, and also take account some of the challenges that's happening in the other intersections. So uh, that's it. So in concluding remarks, uh, I want to add a couple of comments. So this study provides an example of the state of art technology that can be used to reduce fast signal delay and improve travel time with no additional infrastructure cost. So we, did, we haven't used any additional infrastructure, all the uh, currently existing infrastructure, the signal controller and everything that was there, we just took the advantage of those data that's coming and then we used those data and then we developed this sort of system. So there was no additional infrastructure cost. It's just making the maximum use of the existing infrastructure. And this study also provides the performance monitoring plan. So um, because these data are coming uh, throughout the year, so we are collecting the data. We are always uh, estimating this uh, uh, travel time in order to capture the seasonal variation or any sort of uh, variability throughout the year. So it's also a uh, performance monitoring plan if uh, we collect the plan is like we collect the data at least like quarterly so that we can uh, tweak the signal timings we can periodically check if it's performing uh, as are our expectation or not so this type of performance monitoring plan um, helps uh, the decision makers to streamline the operations uh, it also helps us to tackle any problems much sooner and and also it provides better service to the customers for sure um, and uh, uh, the last point or last comment I want to make is that the findings from the study can potentially be applied to any future transit way upon successful pilots. So we just had our uh, the newest transit way or also known as uh, BRT line, uh, also known as Max Yellow, which just opened three weeks ago, uh, end of December. And uh, the Max Yellow BRT line also has a dedicated transit way, exactly like this uh, Max Parkle or 17th Avenue transit way. And we are already collecting data and we are evaluating the results. So um, maybe we can take some of the lessons uh, or we, some of the outcomes we can take from this study and we can apply it in our newly opened Max Yellow BRT line to see if some of the outcome can be applied to the new transit way and if we, if we can be able to achieve some of the benefits as well. So uh, that's pretty much all from these studies. Uh, hopefully uh, everyone enjoys the presentation. And if you have any questions, I am open to answer any kind of questions. Thank you.